This thing on, yeah? yeah? OK, thank you. So this paper is uh, you know, part of my debate with the sort of techno pessimists. You know, so techno pessimism comes basically in two flavors. You know, one is my you know, eminent but uh, misguided colleague, Robert J. Gordon's uh, <laughs> hypothesis of technological uh, slowdown. That basically maintains the sort of old gag of you know, everything that could be invented has been, and future innovation is not going to be able to offset these headwinds that, that, that he perceives. The other brand of techno pessimists are sort of the apocalyptics, right? The people who foresee a world in which, oh, people have been entirely replaced and displaced by machines by some combination of artificial intelligence, robots, and you know, more sinister ways in which, in, you know, intelligent non-humans will create some hazy form of, of, of dystopia. And as I said yesterday, there are very serious people who have this sort of somewhat hazy fear, including, you know, Bill Gates and Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk and, and so on and so forth. Now, sort of, uh, the good news is, of course, that both of those pessimistic, pessimistic predictions cannot both be right. <laughs> the better news is that they can both be wrong, <laughs> as I will argue. Uh, so I'm going to leave aside these sort of ver various uh, Kurzweilian singularities, sort of men, you know, men being eaten by machines, sort of dystopias. Instead, I want to think on one particular part of the paper, which is whether technological progress uh, will affect labor markets in some kind of radical and maybe potentially catastrophic way. So just to sort of clear the ground, I mean, where do I stand on this? I mean, uh, clearly, I totally disagree that the low-hanging fruits of technology, low-hanging fruits have all been picked. Uh, sort of to extend the analogy a little bit, you know, the main reason why this can never be the case is because, you know, science builds taller and taller ladders to pick fruits that are hanging higher. That's exactly what science has always done and is what it continues to do. And so if you build this in some kind of positive feedback model, as I've done, Basically, the standard answer is you ain't seen nothing yet. And I think basically that is the gist of this conference. So, you know, I have a book, 2018, maybe optimistic, who knows, um, <laughs> uh, about this. But lots of other people have been arguing this. We listened yesterday to uh, Vino Kosla. Uh, right here at Toronto, uh, there is uh, uh, Michel Alexopoulos and John Cohen in the economics department who have sort of taken a rather interesting and unusual uh, approach to this. And their prediction is, 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 is very much the same. Um, and so, you know, here's the question. If technological progress continues, you know, what's going to happen to work? And most of the descriptions of this, and I mean, this is a, sort of, uh, are, are rather dystopian and apocalyptic. So here's a quote from Yuval Harari's sort of second book, which is not as good as his first book, but then who ever is. Uh, and he describes, you know, a useless class who will not merely be unemployed, they will be unemployable, which is sort of horrible. You know, uh, somewhat similar to Leontiev's famous 1983 essay in which he made the comparison with horses. And many of the people sitting here, including you know, Jim Besson and David O'Tor and, 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 and Eric Brynjolfsson, have contributed to this literature. You know, some more optimistic, some more pessimistic, but basically I don't think anybody signs up to some kind of uh, Harari kind of uh, dystopia. So as an economic historian, of course, uh, obviously, we've seen this movie before. You know, in the past, workers often feared that machinery would make them redundant and uh, devalue their human capital. And so they have in the past resisted technological progress and mechanization. It is true, of course, that people have repeatedly said this, you know, that our you know, AI is a game changer, or I, I, I like to call, use the physicist uh, um, expression of a phase transition. But the Industrial Revolution, it was no less of a game changer. It didn't have artificial intelligence, but it, you know, it's not, not only as somebody recited that, which I, Alfred North says, White has famous statement that the Industrial Revolution was the invention of how to invent. I actually think that's probably not correct. But what it is, what is true, is that it's the first time in which people were able to convert one form of energy, heat, into another form of energy, motion. And that's huge. And that's what we've been driving everything else. We can talk about that later on. So here is the resistance. You probably have all seen this. These are the Luddites in Nottinghamshire. Here are two guys br uh, uh, breaking a, a netting frame and you know, the famous posters. This is just the tip of the iceberg. These things like this were happening all over Europe. They were happening in France, in Belgium, in Germany. You know, these people were all really worried that this would happen. And not just the workers themselves. Here's uh, uh, you know, uh, Kevin Bryant yesterday already cited Ricardo. It's always good for a laugh. Uh, so, you know, in the first edition of, of the principles of, third edition, 
He basically says, you know, substitution of machinery for human labor is often very injurious to the interest of the class of laborers. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, this isn't somebody who is, as, you know, this is not the dumbest idea I've ever seen. In fact, he goes further than that. This is not uh, as well known, but this is a letter he wrote in 1821, two years before his death, to J.R. McCulloch. And here's what you have. This is almost dystopian. He says, if machinery could do all the work that labor now does, there would be no demand for labor, and nobody would be entitled to consume anything who was not a capitalist and who could not hire or buy a machine. That is really very prescient, okay? Now, to be fair, Ricardo really re put this in the subjunctive and conditional mode and, you know, and basically said that in the end, things would turn out to be right. As it turned out, as we all know, these concerns were unfounded. Uh, you know, the Luddites' fears, you know, in the long run were misplaced. Uh, so that, of course, didn't help them in the transitional dynamics. And so, you know, the plight of the handloom weaver is well known. But the sons and daughters of these handloom weavers, nail makers, framework knitters, and other people being, who were replaced by machinery, they found employment as railroad engineers, electricians, telegraph operators, you know, department store clerks, and other occupations that in 1825 simply were not imaginable. Or they migrated <laughs> to the United States. And the United States, of course, things went much better. Uh, as we all know, employment in farming essentially disappeared. And you can see the sort of, uh, you know, over 60% still at the Civil War. And, you know, everybody knows these numbers. And uh, nor did manufacturing pick up the, the, the slack. Here's the employment in uh, uh, manufacturing. If you look at individual sectors, you basically see the same thing. Uh, and this is uh, courtesy of Jim Besson. And you start to see textile workers. They all sort of keep rising long after the technological peak. And then they start to, be, uh, to decline as these markets uh, uh, become saturated. And yet, to everybody's surprise perhaps, the US economy or the British economy didn't collapse. Streets went filled with desperate, unemployable people, except perhaps during the Great Depression. And that was not driven by labor-saving technological progress. And so, so far, it's fair to say that any evidence for long-term massive unemployment is essentially non-existent. And the reason has already been, has been pointed out that this conference is A, the growth of services, and B, the fact that productivity growth is relentless but relatively slow. And so the system has time uh, to adjust. So this is what's happening in, in, in services. You can sort of see rises in services. And as somebody pointed out earlier, that's all a very good reason why many of our Measurements of total factor productivity are, are incorrect. But here's the question. Maybe this time it's different. And so, uh, you know, is it possible that the rate of technological change is going to be so fast and that job creation in services may not keep up with job destruction? And so, you now, could not Ricardo's nightmare eventually be realized? So let me make just one or two observations on this, okay? Uh, so, in process innovation, in which we basically just have the isoquant shift shifting into the left, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's ambiguous, right? As Jim Besson has pointed out, it depends, of course, because prices can come down, so it depends on the elasticity uh, of demand uh, with respect to price, but also the elasticity of demand with respect to quality, which is something we really sub uh, often leave out, or user friendliness, which is a dimension of quality that I think is terribly important. But in product innovation, unlike process innovation, is there's no presumption at all that people will be replaced unless these new products substitute for things that were very close to them. So in 1914, you know, if somebody had told my grandmother that her great-grandchildren would be, you know, video game designers or cybersecurity specialists or veterinary psychiatrists, I mean, who could imagine <laughs> that these jobs would ever exist? And yet today, they do exist. And so you might ask, what kind of jobs, ladies and gentlemen, can we expect for 2050? And I must say, you know, our imagination falls short here. And this is sort of by construction, I would say. Uh, but I'll make some guesses all the same, of course. <laughs> so one thing that we know for sure is that the aging of the population will continue apace. And so geriatric services, uh, geriatric medicine, pharmaceuticals, and personal care will become 
a bigger occupation. These may well be sort of these BOMO-like occupations that are going to be increasingly hard uh, to mechanize. I'm not saying it's impossible. I mean, Danny uh, convinced me that there's, it, you know, there is some chance that it will happen, but not certainly not in the foreseeable future. The other thing which is we can predict is an also demo yeah, a demographic point, which is people are going to have fewer children. Uh, and so this means that we're probably more likely to invest in the quality of education of our youth, especially, I hope, uh, toddlers and, and, and preschoolers. And one suspects the pet industry will do well. Um, now, none of these sectors are likely to be taken over by robots. I mean, I actually don't think that these robotic dogs that we see in Japan are going to go anywhere, but maybe somebody uh, disagrees with me on that. But by and large, I think what so far digital technology has done is that for every example which is substitute for labor, it's a complement with, with it, okay? And so I think they, 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 there's much more complementarity than the fear mongers would suggest. You look at something like WebMD, for instance, okay? It doesn't really make visits to the doctors uh, unnecessary. What it basically means is when the patient walks into the doctor's office, she or he has better information, and it's harder for the doctor to bullshit them, which is probably in uh, progress, okay? Um, I actually also don't believe uh, we're likely to see uh, driverless trucks in the foreseeable future. I think they will become like pilotless uh, planes. Daniel disagrees with me on that, we will see. Uh, now, of course, what we know with certainty is the transitional dynamics are never painless. And, and for the simple reason is simply because human capital is putty clay. You know, it's not malleable. You know, steel workers and stock drivers cannot just become orthopedic surgeons simply because that's where the need now exists, right? And so the likelihood is, as we've seen in the previous paper, that machines are going to pick up uh, 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 more and more routine jobs, including mental jobs ones that humans used to do, and, you know, boring jobs will be the first to uh, disappear. I do think that there are certain characteristics about human ability that will be incredibly hard to replicate. Not impossible, but incredibly hard, okay? And there are things that, that require instinct, intuition, imagination, of course, human contact, tacit knowledge we already talked about, but also what the Germans call, you know, a fingerspitzengefühl, you know, this sort, of, this, this sort of sense in your fingers, or, you know, some kind of je ne sais quoi, that can't yet be, yet be mimicked by algorithms, and which will be increasingly hard to do. But let's, just for the sake of argument, take a worst case analysis, okay? Suppose that in the long run, indeed, demand for labor falls behind the supply, so that there are fewer jobs. I mean, the concept of a job itself may be up for grabs, but that's a different story. So how much will people work, okay? And here, you know, all I can say <laughs> is, we'll repeat what Vinod said yesterday, the boundaries between leisure and work have become fuzzy. You know, in the long run, we may be living in a world that the only people who work are uh, people who want to, rather than uh, who have to. So if you like to work, you, you know, work up to the point where your marginal utility uh, of labor is zero. Here's a factoid. More than 25% of all Americans do some kind of volunteer work, okay? So this is work for which they get utility but don't get paid. Now those in the labor force spend, uh, those not in the labor force spend obviously uh, a bit more time volunteering. This is uh, current population survey data. And so if people don't work, what will they do? And I want to remind everybody that in the 20th century, one of the most dramatic technological revolutions has been in leisure. Uh, improvement in leisure options and the quality of these options, in the particularly in the second half of the 20th century, have been subject to as much technological progress as we have seen anywhere. And so we have basically invented massive spectator sports, video games that are complemented by high, you know, high definition flat screen, you know, high quality headphones. These things have arisen de novo, essentially, uh, in the past centuries, okay? And then we have electronic forms of social capital. We all know what they are. Half of us are working for these people. Uh, um, and so uh, similar ways in which di digital technology affects human interaction. And in fact, this widely publicized paper by Aguert and Eric Hurst essentially has suggested that technological progress in leisure goods, in this case video games, has affected the labor force participation of prime-aged males hooked on video games. Now, this debate is still ongoing. I'm not totally sure I entirely believe it. 
But if this argument holds up too, then again, we ain't seen nothing yet because, sorry, because the promise of uh, virtual reality entertainment, which may revolutionize uh, video games and turn them into what is known now as multi-century virtual experience. I mean, I shudder to think about what that was like, okay? Now, <laughs> leisure, you know, even before the 20th century, it's sort of hard to convince myself, and I know a little bit about you know, what happened before the 20th century. You know, things weren't so bad for the people who were leisurely. So here's a quote from the same article that uh, where Leontief mentions his horses, but this is actually a better quote. He says, those who ask what the average working man and woman could do with so much free time forget that in Victorian England, the upper classes did not seem to have been demoralized by their idleness. <laughs> some went hunting, some engaged in politics, and still others created some of the greatest poetry, literature, and science the world has ever known. Now, of course, this isn't just true for Victorian Britain. This is, goes back all the way, all over the world. You know, medieval China, Roman Empire, you name it. You know, there are very few examples of some landowner who says, gee, I really feel bored. I'm going to pick up a shovel, you know, and plow a field. That didn't happen. <laughs> and so, again, this, we'll go back to the history of thought. This is not new. You know, over a century ago, Thorsten Veblen wrote a classic article about this. And you may ask yourself, you know, what does idleness look like? Well, this is what idleness look like. <laughs> He's it, it, it's kind of human. He doesn't seem to be suffering, you know. <laughs> Finally, of course, and I can't help, it hasn't been cited yet, but every conference like this does make this quote a bow to Keynes and his economic possibilities to our grandchildren. And, you know, I'm not going to read this whole quote. You probably all know it by heart. But I like about this is what he says about the old Adam. Now, he never explained what he mean, means by the old Adam, but we all should know. You know, in the sweat of thy brow, thou shalt eat bread. That was the curse uh, imposed on Adam by God. You know, we're solving that problem, as Keynes pointed out. Maybe not quite in the way he said, but we are. So in the limit, as I said, if we were to reach the kind of world that, that, that uh, Danny Kahneman is thinking about, what we may well call work may become undistinguishable from leisure as it is today for college professors in the first place, <laughs> uh, except, except we, we get paid. And that raises very, very serious issues of income distribution, which Jeff alluded to, and the equality of ownership of the means of production. And it may require a radical new approach to economics. And so I want to say something, since I am a great admirer of the late Douglas North, about institutions. If the techno-optimist scenario holds up. Will this new world be utopian or dystopian? And so I think one could make an argument that an ever more bountiful, productive economy is a bit like a major oil discovery. You know, a huge windfall, an infinite windfall, if we are to believe those, 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 those exploding models. Now, we can treat this the way Norway or Canada did and become a progressive welfare state in which most people share in some ways in the blessing, or we become like Russia or Nigeria in which the revenues are stashed away for the benefit of a small kleptocratic elite. And that's, of course, where politics and policies come in. Uh, it's not, the question is not, will there be jobs, but how will the plenteousness of science and ingenuity be distributed to all of mankind? And if nothing is changed from current trends, I fear that Keynes' utopian vision may not actually come to pass. Not because there aren't enough fruits at the top of the tree, but because of growing popular opposition to an economic system that is seen by most as unfair and benefiting to a few. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I always have this problem when I have to discuss uh, George Mokir. You know, I enjoy tremendously uh, his writing and listening to him. But then, you know, he's so entertaining. And, uh, you know, his command of economic history is such that, you know, you cannot challenge him. And I tend to agree with him. So, you know, what's left to do? <laughs> so that's a, that's a, a, a big problem. So what's, what's the takeout uh, uh, from um, his uh, paper or the, one of the takeouts is that and he's really looking at 200 years of technological change, and you know he is the preeminent economic historian in that respect. And so, you know, there are always in each, uh, with each GPT, there are the optimists and the pessimists, and there are various types of uh, 
pessimist, uh, those that uh, fear that there's going to be too little uh, uh, technical change, and those that, those that fear that it's going to be too much. And essentially what the oil is, is, is saying is, uh, you know, don't pay too much attention to them. Luckily, history has proven them wrong time and again. Okay, so that's kind of, okay, you know, let's uh, get started from there. So is this time different? I have no idea. And after these uh, two days, I am more confused that, uh, than ever. You know, I learned a lot. But I want to argue just to make one point in this, in this uh, discussion. And I think that this time, or at this stage of the game, not this time, it's different from our point of view, from the point of view of society, from the, of the receiving side, not from the point of view of technology. From the point of view of an advanced democratic society, and our ability to cope with what comes with the GPT. So that's the point I want to make. So essentially, you know, let me start by, you know, I kind of I put together this uh, phrase here, paraphrasing Newton standing on uh, the shoulders of giants. So essentially, we enjoy higher standards of living because we are standing on the broken backs <laughs> of those that paved the way for technological progress but did not live to benefit from it. And that's essentially what you were saying Okay, and that's a reality we can laugh at it, but you know, it's, it's very, very true. And so you will think that you know, uh, at the dawn of the 21st century, we would have learned something and we would have put in place in policy mechanisms to sort of soften the impact on the losers. There are always going to be winners and losers. Well, we have done quite a bit of progress. We have you know, safety nets that didn't exist at all we have unemployment benefits and we have, in some countries, health insurance, not in, other, in others, and, and so forth and so on. But you know, they're, 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 these mechanisms are not really very effective in many dimensions. We see the consequences of that. And in particular, it's not clear that they can handle large flows of technologically displaced workers and at the same time, long life expectancy. You see, it's the conjunction of two these two things that we have to pay attention to. And this is the key, the key point I want to make. Uh, I, I, we live in an era that I call the, there is this phenomenon of the democratization of expectations. So, you know, the extent to which people are ready to bear the costs of something happen in the economy, okay? And say, well, you know, yep, in the long run, you know, it's going to be fine. I'm ready to sacrifice myself, you know, I'm going to be worse off, but you know, all these neighbor, my neighbors are going to be better off, it's fine with me. You see, the, the, that idea uh, uh, that people are much less tolerant now, because that's part of the standard of living, the increases in standard of living. People demand more, okay, in that sense, not in the material sense, but you know, kind of in the participation sense and the spread of democracy, which is a great thing. We are more impatient, we are more demanding of our governments, we are le much less tolerant of failures you know, of our governments, uh, or the collective will, if you wish, uh, to deal with winners and losers. So, so I think it's not this time in the sense of 2017 after AI. I mean, at this stage in the game, in the sense of economic and social evolution, and democracy, the conjunction of the two, and it has been a gradual pro process, we are much more, uh, much less willing to put up with just winners there, losers there, wait 200 years, and, 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 and you know, for, for the results to show up. But it's not only that. I mean, we know when the systematic divide between technological losers and, and winners coincides with the political divide, that becomes dangerous for democracy. And I think that that's what's happening in the US, in certain parts of Europe, is a reflection of that. And we have to pay attention to it because you know, we may be undoing the very system that has been responsible to bring us all these goodies, okay? So that's, and, and the, the other thing again, which is different, is that longer life expectancy. So imagine somebody that gets less off, laid off at the age of 50, okay? And even software programmers, you know, 45, they become obsolete. 
They have 40 years in front of them, or 30 years. What we will do? Can we manage to provide for them? Are the pension systems capable? Or providing a decent living with le leisure and healthcare and so forth? Not clear. So the point is that governments, I think, will not have a choice but to, has to take much more responsibility for the transitions that you were mentioning, Joel. Not just for trying at the margin to elevate the costs, okay? That's that we have been doing. And there are many various ways of doing that. One is to try to reduce the number of losers, but not, you know, the discussion yesterday we had in the panel, not by, God forbid, you know, slow the pace of theological change, but totally nuts. I don't think that nobody in this room is proposing that, but making sure that more can participate. So how do we do that? Well, we have, I, I want to talk about three things. One is education in, in a particular way, personal services and the direction of technical change. What about education? So uh, I, I'm a bit surprised that we haven't mentioned that. You know, the technological revolutions of the uh, 19th century and, and also in the 20th century went hand in hand with the revolution in education, okay? But ever since we had, you know, this model, one model, you know, it's called the factory model of education, and we had more and more of the same. More years up front and later on, right? It's amazing how data has grown, more hours, more subjects and so forth, more teachers, more, 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 more of the same. But we need really a revolution in education, not very different from what happened in the 19th century that will essentially shift the focus to a different set of skills. Now, let me talk about skills for a moment. These are just three sets of what are the top skills sought for employment today, not in 10 years from now, okay? And it's amazing when you look at it, okay? These are, you know, this is UNICEF and these are two uh, very well-known sites that kind of, you know, do this, job, this uh, thing of collecting data on, on skills. Now, you know, most of these skills are, you don't find them, not in the K to 12 system, certainly not with higher education. And uh, this is something I want to remark because we come from there. Higher education, by and large, universities see themselves, see themselves completely uh, 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 above, you know, the fray. They don't have to deal with skills. They deal with knowledge, okay? Skills, it's not for them to impart, okay? It's not part of the, explicit mission of universities and K-12 doesn't do it. Now, there are different types of uh, skills. I, I'm not going to go through this, it's, but it's very interesting. Look at the type of skills we're talking about, okay? They don't happen. I mean, you know, this is interpersonal communication, okay? Emotional, self-confidence, all these things. You know, you don't find them in a curriculum. You don't, you, they're not being measured. You know, the PISA test that, you know, nations, you know, fight about it, countries, okay? It's not it, okay? So what do we need to do? Uh, Joel uh, talked about inverting the pyramid, you know, with the early age. I have a lot to say about that. I've been working on that for the past few years, implement, trying to implement policies that will dramatically change the nature of early age education. We are having some success. We need bottom market experimentation in the field of education. The idea that the Ministry of Education, you know, will kind of think about the, the new education revolution, draw a curriculum and impose it on the system is totally ludicrous. It, it contradicts the very nature of what we need to do, okay? And we, do, we need research on effectiveness. By the way, we can play a role there, okay? Let me go quickly through the others. Personal services. You know, personal care, healthcare, social assistance, et cetera. E, you know, when you look at the projections of the VLS for the next 10 years, this is where the mass of new employment is. Okay, nowhere else. There. Okay. Typically, these are require little training, low wages, low status, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, this is not a given in nature. And I want to bring the example of nurses in the U.S. I found that incredibly revealing. Your know, nurse, nurses after the Second World War were the lowest female occupation in the U.S., lower than textile 
women working in textile, okay? Until 1964, when Congress passed the Nurse Training Act that upgraded the, the, the requirements, you needed a degree, blah, blah, blah. In less than a generation, nursing turned into <laughs> a very high skilled high paid occupation. Not only that, but nurse, nurses were playing an important role in the adoption of medical technologies, okay? And you know, there was, a, 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 there was not just one thing called nursing, but there are different categories and so forth and so on, like happens in the profession. So you can change the nature of an occupation. And if we do that with, uh, uh, with the other occupations in personal care and so forth, you will, A, you will mention in your that you want to, uh, we want to increase the quality of, the, of our children. Sure, who is going to do that? I mean, if, you know, at the crucial ages, there is no requirement in terms of uh, 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 education and so forth. So this is something which is, uh, I find, incredibly important. And not all of that, but then you can have a much better interface between the, those giving the personal care, the AI capabilities, and those that receive the personal care. And then there is the direction of technological change. And, and there is this uh, duality, this distinction between human enhancing and human replacing innovation. And you know, we have mentioned these things with different names and, and so forth. And the question is, is this something which is completely outside the realm of human intervention in the sense of where technology goes. You know, it goes where it goes, and if it goes into Walmart type of human replacement, fine, that's the way it has to be. Uh, it, no, well, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure, but I think that we should pay attention to this. Perhaps we can influence the course of technological change, not just you know, the famous volume, NBR volume, the rate and direction of inventive activity, not just the rate, but maybe also the direction, and certainly going in the direction of human enhancement has profound positive consequences. As well. So just concluding re remarks. Uh, uh, luckily, as, as Joel has shown us, the, these small uh, technological prophecies really come to pass, so we shouldn't worry about it. But the changes that are needed in policies okay, usually take too long for the stage we have reached in our societies, in our democracies. And so, you know, we have to anticipate those, those changes as far as we can. We have to design new policies, we have to experiment, etc., and don't just sit and wait because things are going to be fine uh, in the future. We can, by the way, deploy new technologies for that purpose. When I, yesterday I, in the panel, I asked the question about using AI for government. I was thinking about that, you know, designing new policies for education, for personal care and so forth. It's not trivial. You need data, you need processing and so forth. We can do it, but you have to put your mind into it and decide that that's uh, important. And the last point is, I mean, I, this is a call for arms, really. I think that we as economists can play a profound role in doing these things. And we have been sitting on the sidelines too much, okay? And you know, it's very nice to sit and discuss whether this time is different or not and go home and feel fine about it. But we can do something, okay? Because you know, the, we have reached a point not of singularity for technology, but perhaps for democracy and society. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, start with Carl. You know, it's hard not to sit. I think I'm not alone. The last few speakers, Jeff, Manuel, Joel, and be just struck by the importance of the income distribution uh, impl implications here. Now, maybe this is all just setting things up for Joe Stiglitz later. Um, maybe that was all scripted. Um, but I'm also thinking, um, and by the way, just this week, the, this, you know, this booth uh, expert poll that they do in Chicago, the, the question this week was on robots and AI. I don't know how many of you know this, but that, those, those, those economists um, basically largely agreed that um, holding labor market institutions and job training fixed the rising roles of, role of robots and AI 
would substantially increase the number of workers in advanced countries who are unemployed for long periods. And also agreed that, but, but it was overall an increase in the total size of the pie. So if we move the, if we did optimal dis redistribution, everybody could be better off, okay? So could be is not really good enough. Uh, and I have to say, Joel, I think comparing the British upper class uh, to uh, if I think about the working class in Kentucky now, I just don't think it's really uh, comparable. So, so I think we, we have to be very careful about that. Where that all goes for me is maybe a missing topic today. How does the economics relate to the politics? Okay. Um, and if we're going to not be on the sidelines, I think we have to be realistic about that. Uh, uh, so I would just expand things in that direction because income distribution is so important. There were decades where people became worse off uh, over a fairly long period. And um, during that period, I mean, the end of that period is things like the revolutions of 1848 and suggestions for institutional change that would have been really, really harmful uh, in the long run. And so I'm just curious what, what history has to tell us about how we can help along a transition path without generating bad institutional persistence that's hard to reverse once we get past that sort of negative transition path. Um, yes, we had two quick points. The first one is on uh, government policy, which has already been brought up, but I just wanted to emphasize when we're thinking about the history and we go back to the 20th century, the importance of understanding the social movements and government reactions that allowed a lot of the benefits to be widely distributed from the free high school movement to the movement for a 40-hour work week to the movement for an eight-hour work day and all of these things led to regulation. Um, and perhaps one of the more important ones was worker safety regulation, which just redistributed the fruits of some of what we were achieving to workers in the form of safety. And we don't often think about that because it's not income, but they were certainly made much better off uh, because they were no longer risking life and limb in, uh, at, at work. And so that's, I think, really going to be a very important part of what happens going forward. And it's why I get a little bit worried when I see the sort of anti-regulatory movement that's happening in our political regimes. And then the second point I wanted to make is, is very different, but just to say, you know, one of the things you said is you expect in developed countries for birth rates to continue to come down. I, for one, see that as a place where technological improvements are going to perhaps turn that thing around. Uh, I had more options to time my fertility than my mother did, and I expect my daughter to have more options about how she times her fertility. So she may have more children. I've also found that some of the things I do as a parent are already being outsourced. Uh, I, my son, who's four, asked me to do something for him the other day. I didn't do it fast enough, so he went and got OK Google and asked Google to do it for him. Um, so, so, uh, one, you know, totally fascinating. Um, so, just kind of putting together the last two talks, I just want to raise one thing. It just, you know, hasn't been mentioned in this conference, but we should be clear. I think it's useful to be clear about it. Is that to the extent that we view, as in, say, the growth bottle, and I think as Joel's been thinking about this, that what this is is technology. That what artificial intelligence is is a technology that augments human labor in some way or, you know, kind of replaces tasks, however we think about that, then I think that largely you must be correct in terms, you know, if you sort of stitch together, I think, the analysis of the last two papers with significant, you know, point towards Manuel as well as others' points about income distribution. That having been said, I think we should be clear about the implications of what was discussed last night the development of general human intelligence or intelligence of some sort will ultimately, if that occurs, which is, let me be clear, not what I think is the nature of machine learning, but something else, more like what Danny was talking about, you have to give that, whatever that is, it's sentient, and you have to give it rights. You have to give it political will. You're gonna create something, not over the course of 10 years or 20 years, but the other piece of this is something over 50 or 100 years where 
the basic neural network that runs a brain will be able to be replicated in some digital or biological form that's not human. And then you have to think about them, that, that's a thing that we will want to accord rights to. And let me clear, once that happens, I worry that you have a different prospect. And I think it goes a little bit to the discussion that was made yesterday, I think, by Joel. That is, I think, what Elon Musk worries about. Just so we place it right on the table. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Danny, then Ian, and then I'll give Joel time to respond. Oh, and Yan, and then time to respond. Joya spoke about techno-pessimism. I really think that the, the real theme, and, and that's how I read Harari, is political pessimism. And it's do existing institutions and the culture behind them, are they, are they able to cope with this challenge? And in the United States, you know, there are two forces that you can see inequality and wealth buying politics. I mean, that combination is deadly, coupled with the culture of individualism. That's, that means that people want to be independent and that sort of there is, it's a society that, and it's a culture that doesn't like losers. They don't like losers, and it's, in that sense, very different from Canada, very different from Europe. It, it is a, an American specialty, the dislike of losers. How that is the problem, it seems to me. It's entirely whether the institutions can adjust. It is not a, an issue of, of economics alone. Great, so a few more hands went up, so if everybody can be uh, efficient in their questions, Ian. I'm only going to offer the footnote to Joel's comment about the Victorian leisure class and their interest in hunting, were described as the unspeakable in pursuit of the inedible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but also, also just to observe that you know one of the things we got out of that episode in history is a bunch, a lot of you know militarism, you know colonialism, a bunch of of kind of unsavory aspects of that you know plutocratic type of society, which you know democracy for a very few and a lot of bad side effects. Ultimately, you end up arguably with you know, World War I, the Great Depression, fascism, World War II, and so forth. OK. Um, Jan? Yeah, I mean, there is certainly a danger with growing inequality of, you know, seeing uh, the emergence of Marxism 2.0. But um, I wanted to uh, comment on you know, what Elon Musk is worried about. Um, it's not entirely clear. Um, there is one thing he's worried about, which is kind of the really easy to prevent Nick Bockstrom type scenario of kind of badly designing the objective function of an, of an AI system and telling it to produce you know, as many paper clips as possible and the machine uh, being super intelligent uh, ends up converting the entire galaxy into paper clips. Um, this is a stupid scenario in the sense that if we are smart enough to produce uh, super intelligent machines, we'll also probably be more than smart enough to figure out how to build their objective functions so they don't do stupid things like that. Um, it, I, I don't view this as a major technical issue in the same sense as uh, it was hard to invent the internal combustion engine, uh, but figuring out how to build a brake or safety belts wasn't that hard. And you know you need those for cars to be safe, and it's a uh, you know technologically considerably simpler uh, problem. So I, I, I view the, the the same kind of situation there. Um, I, I think you know some of the motivations of, of Elon Musk is um, a, sort of a marketing ploy, essentially, for attracting attention and perhaps even a, a you know a way to kind of uh, um, establish himself as savior of humanity by creating problems. But um, <laughs> that he will then solve. <coughs> so uh, y the the opinion of some other people who have expressed, uh, you know, well-known people who have expressed opinions about the dangers, the long-term dangers of AI, uh, like uh, like Stephen Hawking, for example. Stephen Hawking actually changed his mind about this after he talked to people like David Sassabis and various others. 
Um, so this was kind of a, a first opinion that he had, and then after kind of studying the, the question, has kind of changed his mind a little bit. Uh, and, and I think the, the thinking of a lot of people around this is also evolving uh, relatively quickly thanks to various meetings of this type and others that I've attended to. Thanks. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, I just wanted to <coughs> say a word about uh, the income distribution in one specific context. Uh, I've uh, played with the overlapping generations a variant of this which shows very clearly both the, the utopian and the dystopian view when the positive shock occurs that raises the returns to capital and lowers the returns to labor in an OLG framework it, because capital is owned by the old and uh, labor is owned by the young, you get a, a generational uh, split which is uh, in that framework very sharp. And if uh, no redistribution is made between generations, the old eat their uh, increased uh, cake and the young are left with the worthless labor and you get the odd result that the only beneficiary of this positive shock is the old of the generation in which it occurs and all the future generations can be immiserized without any distortions in the market per se. Uh, all you have to do to make it Pareto improving across generations is take part of the windfall of the old, which by definition is greater than the loss of the young, because this is an efficiency gain, and redistribute that amount in a kind of reverse social security across all generations, and then every generation is made better off. But it's a nice little illustration of the proposition that if it's an extreme case, if you don't do something, you actually not only make a particular class work off, worse off, but conceptually that dystopian view that everybody's impoverished and society loses overall is, is actually not uh, an illogical uh, contradiction. It's uh, uh, a, the normal result of an OLG framework. If you modify that just a little bit, so that in each generation there are rich and poor and you jig the utility function such that the rich either leave bequests, uh, so there's some non-homothetic to it, the, the, the rich leave bequests or make uh, 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 intra vivos transfers, then when they're enriched, their incentive is to help their children along. So you don't need the government to do the redistribution, it happens intrafamilial. But the poor in that setting can't do it or don't do it. And so you get then a sharp divide where the rich part of society lives happily ever after without any government policy because each generation takes care of their kids. Whereas the young or the poor part of the society intragenerationally is impoverished ever onward because they don't make intergenerational transfers. So then it becomes both an intra and an intergenerational divide. For me, the lesson is quite obvious. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's obvious in, in the most basic sense that this is a positive shock to overall capacity and a sharp distributional shock. And so you better redistribute if you want a Pareto improvement and you better take care to redistribute intragenerationally and intergenerationally to think hard about both those problems because it's the young who are the ones that are reaping the loss where it's all the old shareholders of Apple, Google, uh, Amazon and, and the like who are owned by older rich people who are uh, the receiving a massive windfall from all of this technology right now. It's not fully that way. I think we'd still put Zuckerberg somewhere on the young side, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but for uh, most of the shareholders, uh, it's uh, older VC uh, investors. Thank you, Joel, wrapping up. Uh, well, there's more questions here that I, um, I can answer, and I'm just gonna pick and choose like everybody else does. Um, Kevin Bryan's question, I mean, he must have skipped a lecture when I, that I gave about, uh, about what happened to in, in, in Britain after the Industrial Revolution, 
But in fact, they had institutions that coped with it. And until 1834, they had something called a poor law. A poor law was abolished in, or repealed in 1834, but actually the, the effect of it continued. And this, is, this history is actually reasonably well known. And there's a new book coming out by, by George Boyer uh, who will deal with this in great detail. The answer is they muddled through. You know, they did their best with long lags and a lot of talk and lots of parliamentary reports, and then eventually they changed the law a little bit. But the final result, of course, is the emergence of the embryonic proto-welfare state, you know, in 1908 under Lloyd George, and, you know, which was intended to deal with it. That was not much of a consolation for two generations of people who, like Manuel, had their backs broken. Um, about, you know, I mean, Danny Kahneman made, I think, <laughs> A point that, that's on my mind, and, and I keep sort of citing um, what Douglas North uh, uh, once told me, and that is, you know, uh, Joel, he said, you know, there's a good reason why in economic history we talk about technological progress, but institutional change. Um, the latter is much more of a stationary process. It goes up, it goes down, but there is no evidence that, in fact, institutions uh, are getting better around the world. Certainly the last 10 years uh, have, um, have uh, not given us much hope for optimism here. And in fact, I am, may well be a techno-optimist and an institutional pessimist. And that's, that's a hard thing to live with, let me tell you. Um, finally, about Scott Stern's point. <laughs> uh, can neural networks, and this is, I think about this all evening yesterday, you know, can neural networks really replicate humans. You know, maybe I'm getting a little bit mystical in my waning years, but I, I, I tend to believe that there's still something inherently human about us, whether it's the combination of endocrinology, you know, hormones with electrical circuits, and, and I, I don't know what it is. But as I was listening yesterday to whether neural networks can really replicate humans, I was reminded of the famous crack by Groucho Marx, who said, you know, the key to success, he says, is integrity and sincerity. If you can fake those, you've got it made. 